Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications, and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Joining us as an additional host for this segment is none other than John Kinsella. John, welcome. Hey, guys. Why do you guys have the cool music? And we still have, like, you know, the sort of the old music on ASW. Oh, we'll get, we'll get you some new music. We can make that happen. <laughs> Absolutely. He's going to get his own theme music? Yeah, what? You want your own, like, personal Patrick theme yeah, music? Yeah, I, I want, like, walk-up music, like yeah, Devin yeah. Major League Baseball. So right. Get your own song. <laughs> John, do you have a uh, do you have a title? Like, where are you working somewhere that you can publicly disclose, or are yeah, you just like? Um, you might have missed it since I've been bouncing around this year. I am now co-founder and CTO at a company called Sysense. We are um, really what we're trying to do is is make security easier for the SMEs and SMBs. Nice. So those companies that can't deal have a security team, they don't want to deal with um, what hundred page reports. How can we get those guys to be able to get secure? So that's the type of stuff I'm doing now. Awesome. So awesome. like we were just talking about the, the individual yeah. towns that have one person. One person. Yeah. If they're looking, right? Uh, Justin Collins is here with us. Um, people empowered for the product security team at Gusto. He is also the primary author of Breakman, a free static analysis security tool for Ruby on Rails. Joins us tonight. To talk about Breakman. Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Nice to have you. Justin, how did you get your start in, in information security? Um, I needed an internship. And uh, at the time, I was very, I mean, I'm still very into Ruby. At the time, there was a company called AT&T Interactive, which um, I saw on like all the Ruby conference recordings. And I was in LA, they were in LA. So I just applied to all the internships at that company. And the team that called me back was the security team. And that's what got me into security. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. What, what did you do on the security team there as, a, as an intern? I wrote Breakman. There you go. <laughs> you jumped right into writing a static analysis uh, tool for, for Ruby. I started as yeah, an intern I, too. I didn't know. Patrick did start as an intern right here at Security Weekly. Yeah, although yeah. I didn't give you anything as cool to work on, like no. writing a static analysis no, tool we, for Ruby. But we certainly can't talk about the tasks that you <laughs> had me do. But no, it was not writing a static analysis tool. That's for sure. Uh, so what 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 made you, Justin, want to write um, a static analysis tool? I mean, you you were already sounded like you were into Ruby at the time, uh, but we, what made you want to pivot into like writing a security tool for the the language? Um, it basically came down to, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and at t Interactive was a big Ruby on Rails shop at the time. And the commercial tools didn't really cover your Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Mm. So we needed it. Yeah. And I had taken some classes on static analysis, compilers, programming language, that kind of stuff. It was something I was really into. So it seemed like a natural fit. And out of that came Breakman. You yeah, when you guys first, when you first started working on Breakman, I mean, I, I never coded Ruby heavily, but I remember it and like, yeah, there was at that point in history, it was sort of a bit of a it had a reputation of a security cesspool, right? So I think a lot of what you and sort of the result of that tool as it came and matured sort of helped a lot of people think about uh, security a lot more seriously in Ruby. I'd like to think so. That would be a really cool outcome. Um, looking back, so Breakman turned 11 this year, I means it turned 10 last year. And I looked back and, uh, Breakman came out like a week before rails 3.0 and rails 3.0 was the version where they started, uh, escaping HTML by default. So <laughs> prior to that, mm. they weren't, you know, the templating languages weren't even escaping by default. So yeah, it was, it was rails has come a long way security wise since then. How how 
popular is is Ruby and specifically Ruby on Rails today? Is it still still pretty popular with organizations deploying applications? I think so. I mean, there's a lot of conversation of you know, is Ruby dead? Is Rails dead? Um, is maybe it's turning into more of a legacy framework? I, you know, I feel like I'm pretty biased, so I don't mm. want to jump on the Rails is dead, uh, Ruby is dead. Um, you know, Ruby really rode the Rails train. I shouldn't have made that joke, but it, <laughs> it rode Rails uh, in sort of the U.S. I would say, especially in Japan, Ruby is still kind of like. Yeah, they do some web work in it, but they also do like embedded controllers in Ruby. Um, so, you know, I think the Ruby ecosystem is bigger than Rails and web. But in the US, yeah, I see it. It's probably on a little bit of a downtrend. Um, that being said, if you're doing a startup and you're building, you know, something that would work well for a monolithic web app, I still think Rails is probably the fastest way to get you from having nothing. To having you know an MVP of your product and getting it out there. Mm. It's funny. Before when I when I heard that I was going to be hopping on here today as a sort of the the, the plus one, um, I was looking through sort of catching up on Breakman, what you've done over the last as you said eleven years, um, and also at Ruby. So I was looking at and I'm, this isn't to you know um, rag on you or, or Ruby or Ruby or anything else. I think this is sort of interesting. So the Stack Overflow report this year um, put Ruby in popularity at number 17th um, above Dart Assembly and Swift and R. So what I thought was about was interesting about this is all these years as well, this definitely has um, what I've seen is people who use Ruby, who, who really love Ruby, they really hang on to it, as you just said. But here you are, you know, a decade in, um, if, for folks who go out and look at the GitHub repo, you have, what, 15? The number of commits you have is, like, absolutely insane compared to the next person. Um, mm -hmm. But like you're still, I mean, it's 16, 1700 commits, and this is something your your heart's still in. Obviously, you still love it, which is super impressive because so many tools we have in open source, mm. once someone either switches jobs or changes or something, oh, we don't care about that anymore. So kudos, man. That that's pretty impressive. I I appreciate that. I'm really bad at giving up on things. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on top of that, I have been somewhat picky in the jobs that I've taken to make sure either I could work on Breakman or it would be part of my job. Um, working at Gusto, for example, I was looking for a Rails shop. I didn't want to go somewhere that wasn't using yeah. Rails. I wanted to be somewhere where I, I'd, I'd be connected to that community and to developers who are working in Rails. What were some of the most uh, significant challenges with implementing static code analysis? I mean, just in general, Ruby aside, I mean, that's not a, a small undertaking, no? The biggest challenge is always the same. It's false positives. Mm. <laughs> it's super easy to find vulnerabilities. It's really hard to make sure the number of false positives you report is low enough that people don't hate your tool and throw it out the window. So that, that's always been the biggest challenge is just, okay, here's a bad code pattern, but what are all the false positives I'm going to get? And can I make the rule narrow enough that I'm going to get good good results out of it? There are some rules that don't go in because they would just be way too noisy. Yeah, it's proving that context or defining that context, right? That I think really annoys developers, especially, you know, senior developers that really know the language. And then when they see an alert, it's like, hey, your code's vulnerable. And they look at it and go, yeah, but not in that context. And you're right, that's when they throw the tool out and they don't trust it anymore. And that and that's bad. Absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes you just have to explain, look, a, a tool can't understand your application. <laughs> right. uh, there has to be a layer of a human looking at it and, and making a judgment call on it. Um, and Breakman itself, it's, it's kind of like a middle ground between uh, the tools that are more like linting and grepping um, without really any context and the tools that are you know, going to take a couple hours to run but have much more context and, and can have the, the lower false positive rates. Mm. Can yeah, I, I feel like it's table stakes for like your IDE to have some linting tools in it. And I think as developers, we're like, yeah, all right, I know it's the linting tool in my IDE and therefore I'm going to take it with kind of a grain of salt and it helps in these areas. And then as you learn like these other areas, it's like, yeah, I know to just ignore those. But when you start moving into a DevOps pipeline and an SDLC, you want something that's really 
got that false positive problem it, at least 80% solved in order to, to produce code that has integrity. Yeah, and uh, some of it is just being really careful about the rules that you write. Um, and the one, one of the real benefits of Breakman being uh, semi-open source <laughs> is that you know people report it. If, if all Breakman was ever run on was the applications that are either open source or that are at the companies I'm working at, it would be terrible, right? Mm -hmm. People need yeah. to report and say like, hey, yeah, I used it on my code and this came out of it. And then I can go, oh yeah, didn't even think of that scenario. Didn't know right. people would write code like that. Now I can adjust. Now, But that that's what's sort of wonderful about when an open source project gets some sort of traction and gets um, interest from the community, right? It's um, for those who, for those out there who you know if you either haven't done open source, you haven't seen it. What it's one thing to know if someone else is using your code, but once they start contributing back and actually making suggestions, even if it's saying, "Hey, this sucks. I want it fixed," that it it helps give you energy and excitement about you're doing something that other people care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, earlier this year, for example, um, there was a bug in Breakman. And it suddenly started impacting a lot of people. And yeah, I had like, I woke up to like a bunch of messages, uh, several pull requests. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, okay. Like I wouldn't have known that that was a problem. Um, but it's always nice to know that people are using your stuff mm -hmm. and they'll tell you when it breaks. <laughs> and, and I love the community cares enough to report those issues, right? That means you've created yeah. something that's useful to them. Absolutely. One of the things that I always like to advocate for is the, the beginners and the noobs because that's what I always consider myself. So, Justin, just backing up a little bit, do you want to describe what Breakman does, who it's for, what kind of oh, benefits yeah. that you might get out of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, as said at the beginning, uh, Breakman is a static analysis security tool for Ruby on Rails. What does that mean? It means it looks at the code of your Rails application and it tries to find potential security vulnerabilities in it. The difference, like what makes a static analysis tool a static analysis tool is that it's just looking essentially at the text of your code. Uh, it's not running the code. It's not trying to like poke at it. It's just trying to guess based on the text of the code, is this a vulnerability or not? And for Breakman in particular, you can run it pretty much anywhere. Uh, you can run it as part of development. You can run it as part of CI. Um, there are you know, services that will run Breakman for you. Um, and it's this is actually a, a, an issue that I have with a lot of tools. I think it's very beginner friendly in the sense of you install it, you run it, and then you get results out of it. Digging through the results is where you probably have to put in some effort and, and some potentially learning if you're unfamiliar uh, with different security vulnerabilities. But it was very important to me that anyone could install it and run it without having to configure anything, set anything up. You just point it at your code and then it gives you results. And then after that, you can tune it and adjust it as you want. Yeah, I think there's no such thing as a tool that's going to be free of false positives. So you certainly need to dig in and, and see what kinds of things are in there. So. Are, are you kind of saying that, uh, and forgive me, because I'm, I'm not a Ruby developer, so if n some of this doesn't happen, that's totally cool. But are you saying that it's going to catch the typical types of things, like your cross-site scripting? It's going to look for user input that's immediately spit back out. It's going to check for uh, SQL injection possible vulnerabilities or some uh, fail open types of conditions as well? Yep, you hit it, <laughs> you hit it on the head. Um, it, it's those standard things, um, and you know, uh, static analysis tools. So the things that you mentioned are the things that they're generally good at: cross-site scripting, uh, SQL injection, other kinds of injection vulnerabilities are generally pretty easy to spot in code. What a static analysis tool can give you, uh, a couple of things it can give you. One is just a little bit more context. Uh, there's an example I give sometimes in presentations where it's like, okay, look at this code. Is it vulnerable? You don't know because it's like one method call or something, but a tool can look at the context of it and give you some heads up of like, hey, actually, this could be vulnerable uh, or maybe not. Uh, and then the other thing it gives you is just some assurance, right? Um, if you're running it all the time in CI, 
no, it's not going to catch everything. Absolutely, it's not going to catch everything. No tool is going to catch all security issues. Um, but there are certain things that you can know that, okay, like I know I'm running the tool and it didn't report anything. So I'm not doing anything obviously bad. Uh, and then you can look for the not so obvious issues or, or vulnerabilities. Right. Like you've said, it's a, it's a static analysis tool. So it's only going to catch so much where there's certainly going to be other context related uh, or dependent issues that wouldn't be caught until more at runtime or a dynamic analysis. And that's not what this tool does. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, every tool is going to have its strengths and, and its blind spots. There's, I will say, okay, I will say early in my career, I really did think that, um, hey, if we just had like static analysis tools for everything, that would get us so far in securing our applications and it, it will be great. Um, now that I'm a little bit further in, uh, yeah, static analysis tools, it's one tool that you use, and then you're going to get other kinds of coverage from other kinds of tools. And you, you kind of have to put them all together to get the best coverage you possibly can. Yeah, it, it, I, I find they help secure the core, right? Because, you know, later in the news segment, we're going to talk about HTTP request smuggling. And I think if you're, if you can look at your code and make it as secure as possible, that if there are other vulnerabilities that maybe wouldn't be caught, uh, you know, by a static analysis tool, you set yourself up more for success rather than failure by securing the actual, you know, code itself. I would agree with that. Yep. What are some of the best use cases for for Rails today that you've seen, Justin? Yeah, I think, like I said before, if you're a single person or a small team and you're trying to launch and build something brand new, I think that's an excellent case for Rails. And e even from a security perspective, I think that Rails is a good choice for, hey, I just want to build something fast, get it out the door, mm -hmm. get the functionality in place, uh, and, and have everything work. Um, where I see it fall down is once that company grows beyond you know, or that product grows beyond a certain point where you're like, okay, like it's so big that it's hard to work on. It, it gets messy. Um, and it, it's just hard to engineer, uh, rails applications at that scale. It's not impossible. Of course, we have lots of successful examples out there, mm -hmm. you know, GitHub, Shopify, Gusto itself, um, that are large rails apps and they are being successful. But I do think that there is a, a size at which Rails becomes not the best choice. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Another bad choice would be if you really need like something hyper performant. You're doing something really compute and in intensive. Rails mm -hmm. is probably not going to be the best choice. But if you're starting off and you're like, I just want to build something, get it out the door, get users, you know, get revenue coming in. I still think that Rails is an excellent choice. And it's going to come with a lot of secure defaults that other frameworks may not. And that's what's sort of interesting about, say, Rails compared to what, you know, JavaScript is number one on that list, Node stuff. But what we're seeing, you know, we talk about AS on ASW week after week is there's, since the language is so new and the developers are, they haven't gone through a lot of the bumps and nights, which you have and a lot of the, the mm. Rails people have, Ruby people have. Um, security is it's still becoming a little more of a solid concept in there so it's that's interesting um i, I think also think about just that the age and the maturity of a language has been around for that long um i'm curious though talk a little more what do you think it doesn't work really great for larger um code bases is that based off the um the architecture of the language itself or how people are using it or it takes a little more diligence or any thoughts um i think so i'll, I'll for the record, I'm not like a great Rails developer. <laughs> so, uh, for that, for the record, uh, Ruby is a dynamic language. It encourages a lot of dynamic use of the language. And yeah, when you get to a certain size, you want to know that if I make a change over here, it's not going to mess up things over there. And that's where you know I hate it. Hurts me to say it, but you're probably going to want you know a, a statically typed language. Um, you're going to want something that has some guarantees, um, some enforcement of interfaces, um, things like that, so that you can, you know, imagine having 300 developers working on an application. Rails doesn't lend itself well to that. 
uh, unless you're very careful about how you split things up and how you architect things, which I just described the best use case for rails is when you're just trying to go fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So when you're just trying to go fast, you're not going to take the time to lay out. Okay. So in five, 10 years, we're going to have hundreds of developers working on this and we need this beautiful architecture so that they can all work on it safely. Uh, It's just not going to happen. So that that's historically where I've, I've seen rails start to fall down a little bit and Ruby itself. I mean, yeah, Python falls in that camp too, in my opinion too, Justin, right? The same problems you described exist in Python as well. You get to multiple developers and over 10,000 lines of code. And it's like, I need this function needs to really put some, forgive the pun rails around, you know, what, what data you can send it and what can come back. Uh, in Ruby and Python, I, both are kind of loosey goosey about that. If you code it that way, right? Which is kind of how you're taught to code it that way in the, both languages. Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a. At some point, you have to admit that some languages are good at some things. Mm. Some languages are good at other things, and there may be a time if you are building a product, a software company where you have to change what you're using based on the needs of your product and and your company. And again, this does hurt me to say, I love Ruby. Um, I've been using it for a long time, but I still recognize that there are things it's not great at. And there are scales at which it doesn't make sense anymore Mm. to, um, to continue on with Ruby with some, let's say, like you said, so many people working on one code base. A lot of times when you look through the the documentation for projects, you see some really great flags. And I see that you have a great flag in Breakman. If Breakman is running a bit slow, try dash dash faster. That's that's almost like the old enhance, enhance. I love that kind of thing. That's a, that's a great flag that you, you added into there. Do you know of um, any big projects that have been using Breakman? Like, I you know, for example, Metasploit is written in Ruby or Meterpreter. Mm. Do, you, do you know of some that are, are using this? Um, maybe you can clarify what do you mean by using using Breakman? Uh, are you w- aware of um, big projects, or I don't know if you can say anybody that you know of big They're companies? Scanning their code base. Yeah. yeah, that that is. Oh, uh, yep, that has been. Yeah, been using uh, it. I mean, I this. This is probably going to come off as a little pretentious, but you can probably guess that if it's a rail shop, they're they're probably using Breakman once they get to a certain size. Mm. Um, you can see now. I don't know who's on the list, but you can go on the Breakman website, and mm. there's a list of companies. Um, it's probably not super up to date because I was trying to like, you know, do some marketing a few years ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, GitHub uses it. Um, Gusto uses it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're, they're big users. I can also say, you know, when we were selling Breakman Pro, we had everyone from one person shops to very large Fortune 50s that were using Breakman. Um, it's just anyone at, at this point, I think I've done enough marketing at Breakman um, that people are, it's kind of like the standard tool. Like, okay, I'm writing a Rails app. Uh, Oh wait, I need to worry about security. What can I do for security? Okay, I'll, I'll start off with Breakman. That'll give me a starting point for security, uh, for securing my app and, and making sure I'm not making you know really obvious mistakes. Just one of the the tactics that I've been using lately is when I stand up an open source project or tool, for example, and it's using. I mean, it could be Ruby, it could be Python, it could be Go, whatever it is. I read the documentation and I look at what version it recommends. And I ignore the version that comes with my Linux distro and I install that version because I know if I don't do that, I'm in for hours or a day or longer of like pain and suffering to make it work. But that kind of speaks to when you uh, make releases of Breakman, how do you deal with all the different Ruby versions, which I'm assuming is pretty similar to Python and like things, sometimes significant things change between the different versions, which would force you to have some changes in Breakman, right? So I, I've been very fortunate. Um, from the beginning, Breakman has used a project called Ruby Parser, which is mm-hmm. written by Ryan Davis. And when Breakman first came out, uh, that was basically the only project that would parse older. It was basically compatible with older versions of Ruby mm-hmm. uh, as well as newer versions. And so uh, Breakman is really tied to Ruby Parser. And so that's what I rely on for the version support. However, since Breakman is 11 years old, 
you can run it. Uh, the version you use to run Breakman doesn't have to match the version used for your application. Mm -hmm. So if you were running an ancient version of Ruby and an ancient version of Rails, let's say 2.3, um, which is when Breakman was written, mm -hmm. it would still work. Um, wow. amazing. And that's just some backwards compatibility that's been maintained mm -hmm. along the way. Um, I will say as far as like what Breakman uses, um, I've been pretty, like I pretty much stay on like an old version of Ruby, uh, as exciting as it would be to jump on like new features and stuff. When you're maintaining a tool, you want to just keep it as broad as possible. So people don't have to worry too much about getting, you know, basically getting behind on the versions. So I've been very conservative on that, but for analyzing code, yeah, Breakman's basically maintained all of the backwards compatibility and, um, you know, even supporting older versions. Fortunately, there hasn't, it's, it hasn't really happened that a newer version of Rails somehow invalidates the old, the support for older versions. Mm -hmm. So inside of Breakman, basically each Rails version builds on the next. So if you're running, let's say Rails 5, Breakman turns on the flags for Rails 2, 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just in case you're running some weird, you know, you have some weird old code patterns or something, uh, it will still catch them. Yeah, sounds different from Python because that switch from two to three in Python was was a pain oh, in the butt. Mm, huge, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it just, just you know, kind of a, a question more from my own curiosity. When you look at Python, and I'm not sure if you looked at Python Flask or Django, like how does Rails compare just in a general sense and also maybe in a security sense as well. I haven't looked too much at Django um, or Flask really. Um, so I, I guess I can't really comment that much. Um, at a previous job, we were on Python, but it was using a different framework. And in that particular framework, yeah, it was like missing pretty much everything. Uh, you know, it was like the CSERF protection mm -hmm. or you know, just things like that. I do think, and kind of going back to the JavaScript world comment, I do think that new web frameworks really have to meet the bar of the old ones. And it, they should have to, right? Like you shouldn't have to have a regression in security to use a new framework. Mm. Um, on the other hand, I remember seeing a post uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago where someone was like, here's my new templating language. What do you think? And someone was like, oh, cool. What do you do about cross-site scripting? And they're like, oh, what's cross-site scripting? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, we can't, <laughs> we can't really go forward as an industry um, with people writing stuff for the web without being aware of web security. Um, but that is the way it tends to go. And then security is generally added on later. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do feel like, and it, it, I, this hurts me, this hurts me, but I remember early days of Ruby and Rails and it was a lot of people coming from Java. I'm like, oh, like it's so much better than Java, right? Whereas I'm pretty sure the Java people were like, yeah, but our stuff is so secure and so mature and you don't have like any of this security stuff that we have. And now the Rails people are saying that about the newer frameworks, like, oh, right. well, you don't have this security feature and that security feature. Right. And it's become sort of the, you know, the, the mature framework. Um, and it's just funny to see that kind of cycle happen. And I'm sure it will continue to happen. <laughs> Joseph, when you say templating, um, you're referring to things like Jinja. And do you have, I haven't worked with Rails, yep. but I, I've worked with Flask and I've used Jinja. Do you, you have your choices of the templating framework in Rails as well beyond just Jinja? Yeah, uh, you do. The, the three that Breakman supports are ERB, Slim, and Haml. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see much being used outside of that. And all three of those have gotten to a point where they escape, at least if you use them with Rails, mm -hmm. uh, they escape by default. They're not great uh, in the sense of, it's not like context in, you know, context dependent escaping. It's just mm -hmm. HTML escape it. Right. Um, and maybe some helpers for other contexts. But uh, yeah, by default, if you use Rails, um, all the main templating languages will escape by default. That's awesome. Justin, er earlier you referred to a pro version. 
what else do you get from a pro version that isn't in the free? Uh, nothing anymore because Breakman Pro was acquired by Synopsys a couple years ago. And I don't really know what's happened since I left Synopsys. Um, I assume if you buy Coverity, you will get mm. Breakman Pro as part of that. Oh, it went into Coverity. Funny. That's interesting. Yeah. So they they just basically forked it and you still maintain the open source? Is that... Uh, yeah, so technically Breakman is not open source anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it is free. And yeah, I, you know, maybe one day someone from Synopsys will hear me talk about this, but I don't know what's happened to it since I left. Mm -hmm. um, I left uh, 2019 and haven't really had any contact. Um, and I've just kind of gone off and continued maintaining Breakman itself. Technically, they own all of that. Mm -hmm. So... The, I'm basically still working for Synopsys, uh, but for free. Um, but yeah, I've basically wow. just been able to continue maintaining it and, you know, being the head of the the open, well, not open source version, but the, the free version, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, the restrictions there are basically you can't go and build a Coverity competitor. So <laughs> if you're just a, I want to scan my code with Breakman, then it's free to use for you. And so you just produce like a, a binary version of it then? Um, and no, I mean, the source is on GitHub. Um, it's distributed the same way it's always been as a Ruby gem. Um, unfortunately, yeah, the, the pro features mm -hmm. are owned by Synopsys. So gotcha. those are locked up in a Synopsys vault somewhere. Um, but everything, you know, everything since then, uh, yeah, it, it continues to be... Uh, free freely available and what's, source available what's on the uh, the roadmap for you what do, what do you see going forward in the future development well right now it's broken so <laughs> uh yeah there's a bit of a backlog right now for people who are watching this you know on thursday september 16th um I, there was just a really large 5.1 release with uh, just a, a whole ton of changes there. Um, and, and that took so much energy out of me that, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I haven't been spending much time on it. Um, so yeah, it's, there is no real roadmap. I just kind of go with um, what's needed for fixing things, uh, for addressing false positives, um, for updating the parser. Um, and then, you know, as things come up in my day job, um, there's opportunities to improve Breakman for that, uh, new rules, et, et cetera. But I've never really had like much of a, a forward-looking roadmap. I just kind of do what I feel like doing or what's necessary at the time. <laughs> I, yeah, Probably that, in a way. Go ahead. Go uh, sorry, I was going to say, I bet in a way your your roadmap is sort of, I mean, looking at the, the, the release notes you had on that last release were... Um, at some point, I stopped him like, wait, this is still the one release he's talking about. Um, <laughs> so no wonder you're taking a break now. Mm -hmm. But I imagine your roadmap is going to be pushed to a degree by, as new things come out in Ruby to be able to support and scan or, or identify issues with those new bits of code. That's true. Uh, Rails 7 is on the horizon. So I expect some new code patterns to come out of that. Um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, something that came out in the Rails 5.1 release um, is just new... Um, you know, just new ORM methods, new database methods that needed to be checked for SQL injection. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's some of that keeping up. There are, yeah, sometimes there are like new ways of doing things in Rails that then people are like, oh, well, it showed this vulnerability, but I configured it this way or I was doing seeing this feature and so it shouldn't have been a vulnerability. And they go, like, oh yeah, okay, yeah. So for this new version of Rails, this is this new thing that I need to support. Um, another thing that is somewhat of a newer thing in Breakman is there are defaults that get set in different Rails versions. And so, yeah, when Rails 7 comes out, I'll have to take a look at, okay, what are the new default configurations and make sure that if any are relevant to Breakman that, that those get pulled in. So, yeah, Ruby itself and Rails, as new things come out, they push me as well to, to continue uh, maintaining Breakman and, and keeping up with it. Awesome. 
I had a question and then I lost it. I'm sorry. <laughs> then sorry. I, I realized like I hadn't opened my Slack client to, to see any feedback that was coming in and then I, I lost my question. I, I do one thing that's been on the back of my mind, Justin, something you said in the, in the uh, beginning of the interview is that a static analysis uh, tool can't really predict like how programmers are going to write basically code, right? They could do the same thing, but write it differently. And I, I think that's a, and how much it relates to, to security and like what we're talking about. But it's one of the astonishing things to me about programming is that it's an expression of the developer. And I like, oh. I, I, you know, kind of like waxing poetic, right? But I never realized that until I worked on a project where there was multiple developers and then kind of took it over and I could read through the code and go, oh, that code was written by person A and this code was written by person B. And I know, I just, I know that like I would, I would bet a million dollars on it because I know by the way that they wrote code and that must be a real challenge when you are writing a static analysis tool, right? Just knowing the different ways in which people can write code and solve problems and having it be so specific is, is a, a challenge. Yeah. For, for, for maintaining Breakman, for example, yeah, sometimes people are like, oh, but like it warned me about this code or uh, it didn't warn me about this code. Why not? <laughs> like, because I never realized someone would write, write it that like way. like that way. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and something, something that hasn't been touched on, but the reason that Breakman has even been able to exist is because it is specific to one web, web framework. And that one web framework has very specific ways that people tend to do things yeah right people tend to write their applications a certain way and breakman is assuming that you are writing your application that roughly in that direction so yeah sometimes people come in they're like oh but i'm like doing this weird thing over here i'm like okay yeah but that's like so weird um no breakman doesn't know how to yeah. find that or doesn't know what to do with that and it might be good it might be bad or it just might be different Right. Yeah. I, I, and I find like all different scenarios like, oh, that's not necessarily like more secure or, or even less secure. It's just like a different way of doing it, basically. And maybe not the best way for, you know, maintainability of that code moving forward is often what I what I would pick on. Like, yeah, I understood what you did, but I really have to read through that code two or three times to like re-understand what you did if I have to go troubleshoot it. So therefore, it's probably not the best code, but like functionally and even security wise, that code could be totally fine. Absolutely. I mean, hell, even, you know, if I look at my own code a week or two later, I can't tell you what it does all the time. So that's not just someone else's. I mean, sometimes the next day, John, <laughs> right? you get to work the next day and you're like, wait, what did I do yesterday? <laughs> oh, and you read code and you're like, who wrote this? Oh, wait, oh, oh, I did. Yeah, <laughs> that was me. Yeah. The joys of programming. <laughs> joys. Uh, Justin, I was wondering if you could uh, comment because I'm not... Uh, you know, really a Ruby developer, you know, like uh, Patrick was mentioning Metasploit, you know, like I read the Metasploit code, maybe extend it or, or modify it is really some of my extent uh, with uh, with Ruby. Um, but what about the, the various packages? We've been talking a lot about the supply chain and the various components and libraries and their security inside these various frameworks. Um, so, uh, composition analysis, right? How is it with Ruby? Like, what? Where do you see folks um, either falling down or applying controls to make it better so that the libraries and objects you're importing uh, are in fact secure and don't have their own vulnerabilities that you're including in your code? Yeah, absolutely. Break or break, man. Ruby has had its its own share. Uh, the Ruby gems, mm -hmm. you know, is the like npm or um, pypy for Ruby. Right. And yeah, there's been cases of you know, sort of typo squatting. There's mm -hmm. been cases of uh, people's accounts taken over and someone uploads a, uh, a malicious version of a gem. There's been uh, some work around that. For example, um, like for some top number of, you know, pop by popularity gems, you can't upload a version or a, a, another gem that looks too similar in the name. Um, there's also a, a tool, I believe it's called diff end or something like that. Um, and I'm, I'm so sorry to the person who wrote it uh, that I forgot your name, but basically what it allows you to do 
it seems like it's been integrated with rubygems.org. What it allows you to do is be like, okay, what what changed between this version and the last version? Mm. And just kind of do some manual inspection there. Um, it, it's still a problem. You know, it's still the case that I would feel most comfortable having some kind of proxy caching layer in between me and any package manager so that something happens, you can turn it off, <laughs> right? Yeah. You can block a version. Um, I, I don't, for Ruby, I haven't seen much beyond that. I've certainly thought about building something, mm. uh, <laughs> um, you know, but unfortunately don't really have the free time to work on that too much. But yeah, it's a problem. It's, it's a problem for Ruby. Um, oh yeah, there's one other thing that they've done well, two things. One, they kind of pushed two-factor auth a little bit more for Ruby Gems publishing. And then the other thing that they started doing is when you publish to Ruby Gems, it sends you an email saying, hey, you publish these packages, right? If you didn't publish these packages, yeah, like, yeah. you need to take some action, which I thought was a really nice security control. Right. Well, if you do end up writing something, Justin, my biggest gripe with the composition analysis tools is it doesn't tell me which method is vulnerable and if it matches my code and if I'm calling that method. Mm. In other words, I, like I pull in a library and then a tool says, hey, you pull in that library and it's vulnerable. I'm like, yeah, but then I dig in and I'm like, but the vulnerabilities yeah. in this method and I never call that method, therefore, like it's not vulnerable. And it that seems to be still a challenge today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and to be clear, I'm not going to work on composition analysis, but perhaps like malicious uh, code detection or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Joff Thayer has joined us. Hi, Joff. Hey, Joff. Whoa, yes, there he is. I'm here. I, it's good to be here. I've, uh, look, I've, I've dramatically changed up my background recently. Oh, it looks nice. So, it looks nice. Yeah. And so, I do, uh, uh, I mean, other than Joff being awesome and one of my good friends, uh, Joff, you did some similar work uh, in security for Django frameworks. Is that is that true? Yeah, it's been it's been quite some time ago, right now. But um, you know, I, I did some uh, did some work with some common vulnerability stuff and auditing, and, and yeah, um, and it was uh, it was good good stuff. But um, and then I, you went back you know, to Python. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I went back. To, well, <laughs> Python. You know, there's a lot of uh, overlap there. So uh, right. But uh, yeah, good stuff. Well, you're catching me cold though, so I know. Like, yeah, you know, uh, Joff just joined us. You missed most of the conversation, uh, you know, unfortunately. But that's okay. Uh, it's nice to have you here, Joff. Um, yeah. We're we're talking with J Justin uh, wrote Breakman, which is the framework for uh, looking for a static code analysis for Ruby on Rails applications. Oh right, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, no, I did do some stuff in Django. Yeah, it's been like two or three years ago, but similar thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, regular expression matching, a lot of, you know, um, um, you know, looking for specific um, known vulnerabilities at the time and to uh, outline those in any source code, things that people were missing uh, in middleware and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So, Justin, what, what's next uh, for Breakman? I know you don't have a, a roadmap, but uh, are you you're still on kind of hiatus and then you're going to kind of look at the pull request and, and see where it takes you? That's basically it, yeah. Um, or if something urgent comes out, I know people are looking for Ruby 3.0 syntax support, and I know that that's um, pretty close to being ready. And again, I don't work on it. Ryan Davis works on that. Um, but uh, he's been doing a bunch of work on that recently. And so expecting to see probably a release just to at, make sure that that support is in there. But yeah, other than that, yeah, I just kind of carry on. Um, you know, I'm waiting for the day when like people stop using Rails and then I can like feel like, uh, you know, Breakman can ride off into the sunset. I don't know when that will be, but um yeah, I don't, I don't know, Justin. People still use COBOL, so I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> oh, oh, but you know, you know, I have, I gotta say something here that, um, you know, when I when I think <laughs> about Ruby, I I always think about those first couple of root canals that I had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> you've had more than one. Yeah, I have, um, and uh, it, it just is. Oh. You know, I, I've tolerated Ruby when I've needed to, uh, aka Metasploit framework, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, 
it's a tough space, man. I applaud you. I applaud your efforts. I really do. So this, this is tough. This is what I was saying at the beginning. Like, so this guy's been working on this tool for 10 years through all these updates through Ruby and like all sorts of craziness he's added into the product. Um, and yeah, pe- people either love or hate Ruby, but you know, props to you, man, Justin, for for you know mm. keeping up with this. And uh, that, I, that I is... hope you hope you have a, a pleasant journey off into that uh, the sunset when this finally yeah. does. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I mean, do pro- I mean, I guess the question that we're talking about now is like, do programming languages ever really truly die? Mm. Like, at, at what point does it decline in popularity enough where Justin's like, yeah, I can go on and do something else, right? The well, only example th- I can think of is Flash. Yeah. No, it's a great point. Well, yeah, I, my, my, I immediately got this nauseous feeling about Perl when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I bet you there's a lot of Perl code still running out there. There is a lot. Yeah. Of, you know, yeah, that's the thing. Programming languages, um, mm. I think it depends, right? There's a, there's a big delineator between compiled languages and Interpre- interpreted yep. languages. And, uh, you know, compiled languages can potentially die quicker, I think, because, you know, hey, you still got the binaries. It's all good. Yeah, you know? that's a good uh, point, John. Scripted or interpreted languages, um, they kind of tend to live on and pester you forever. Mm. Right? Mm. Uh, it's a thing. So, Justin, we just have five questions for you, uh, five silly questions. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I am ready. Three words to describe yourself. Very private person if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice uh probably boring people with security trivia (laughs) (laughs) if you were to write a book about yourself what would the title be Uh, this is so easy it would be called the breakman guy (laughs) what is your favorite (laughs) hacker movie i think in terms of uh, like movies I've actually seen more than once and enjoy. Uh, it would probably be War Games. I know it's an uh, easy classic answer, but I've watched it, you know, plenty of times. Do you know, classic is good. Yeah, classic. agreed, agreed. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, Alive, not, dead, fictional, or otherwise? And gender doesn't matter. What is a fictional celebrity? That's what I want to know. Homer Simpson. <laughs> like a, Yeah, like a superhero or, yeah fictional character uh, or a real person <laughs> crash that, override that doesn't sound like a good uh, father figure no definitely um, not i would agree with that i feel like john goodman uh like at least portrays kind of like a, a cool father um and then dolly parton seems like extremely wholesome i bet wow. she would be nice to have as a mom that is the first time I've ever heard somebody say Dolly Parton as a mother. That's fantastic. That's I love one. it. Justin, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly this evening. Thank you very much for having me. Coming up next, the security news for this week. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.